بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحبت في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وحياكم الله جميعا continue on in our study of بلوغ مرام the book of marriage, we reach the chapter 7, which is the uh, chapter of divorce or at-talaq. And in this chapter, we will study uh, a hadith pertaining to talaq, pertaining to divorce, separating the spouses, the separation of the spouses, uh, and divorce is generally considered at the hands of the man, meaning that the man uh, is the one who retains this uh, right in Islam. And as we already prior to this uh, sitting, we mentioned in the khula that the khula is where the woman has requested uh, a talaq uh, from her husband, requested to be separated from her husband, requested to be uh, separated from her husband, but uh, not uh, technically uh, considered uh, talaq or divorce. But this is seeking to separate from the husband on be, uh, from the woman's uh, side. So talaq, ahabatifillah, is something, uh, as with many of the ahkam in the sharia, and there are many ahkam related to it. And it also fits, as we see when we get into the hadith, uh, on the, with regards to the five uh, different rulings or ahkam in the sharia, from the halal to the haram. And we'll talk about that in detail when we get into the, uh, when we take the uh, first hadith. So, first, before beginning, just to have a general uh, to have a general background about talaq, uh, talaq, linguistically, it comes from the term uh, itlaq, and this refers to to send or to leave, to send or to leave. So this is linguistically uh, as an Arabic term, meaning the breaking of a bond. And, of course, in Islamic law, it refers to uh, breaking the marital bond. That uh, the husband and wife, the husband with, within it, which is his right and is in his hand predominantly, uh, is to uh, divorce his wife, to separate from his wife. Uh, with regards to the legality of the talaq, as even though we may not uh, in general find it as something which is a good thing and again we'll talk about these ahkam as we get into the hadith and see it as an, uh, generally a negative thing uh, we have to first look at to its legality in the sharia and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al-kareem at-talaqu maratan فَإِمْسَكُمْ بِمَعْرُوفٍ أَوْ تَسْرِيحٌ بِإِحْسَانٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, في كتاب الكريم, The divorce is twice. After that, either you retain her on reasonable terms or release her with kindness. So this is in reference to talaq. This ayat is ref showing the mashru'iyya or the, uh, that divorce is something legislated in Islam if two people are unable to maintain a healthy, uh, loving relationship, that there are three uh, divorces and that the first two, the husband has the right to take his wife back, if she so desires, of course, and if he uh, desires to do so. so this is where we will find, as we'll talk about things like the idda, the waiting period, and so forth, more in detail. But this is what is legislated 
And this is one of the things that we learn from this ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the divorce is twice after that. Either you retain her on reasonable terms or release her with kindness. So this shows us that Islamically, that even in the separation or the breaking of the marital bond in divorce, that justice should be sought and mercy should be sought and kindness is what is matloob or what is desired. So even in the breaking bond, unfortunately, as we know, that many people often it becomes a very hostile affair and people and a lot of times hatred and a lot of times people separate due to this hatred. So it can sometimes be a violent separation. Sometimes it's a, uh, just a, you know, a financial, uh, it becomes a financial, uh, some, you know, controversy with regards to the finances, all kind of difficulties result in, in, uh, the breaking of the, the marital bond, especially in non-Islamic marriages, meaning, uh, marriages, the disbelievers, their system of divorce. But likewise, unfortunately, we find that amongst some of the Muslims that these customs have been embraced where we don't look at the maslaha sharia, the sharia objectives and the sharia, uh, um, the sharia intentions, what's behind those rulings and so forth, and, and maintaining the Islamic brotherhood and in maintaining kindness, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, tasrihum bi ihsan. Uh, so, you know, re, you know, either that you, you hold on to her in goodness. فَأَمْسَكْ بِمَعْرُوفِ تَسْرِيهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ Or to free her, to let her go with goodness, to separate in amicable terms. And this is what Islam uh, teaches us. Uh, and... Another important point regarding divorce is that also there is one of the rulings pertinent to divorce is when someone decrees divorce out of anger. When a man out of anger, which we which happens to all of us, and the Prophet ﷺ warned us, said La Tavlam, and he said this three times, uh, letting us know that we should always try to maintain our composure as best as we can. That should be the objective, is trying, making the effort to maintain our composure. And especially when it comes to dealing with our brothers and sisters in Islam, and even more so in dealing with the family matter in the marital bond. So even when, uh, so what often happens as uh, many case studies show in many of the societies that through anger, and this is why the fuqaha in Islam have spoken about this in the past, that out of anger, often men decree divorce. They pronounce divorce on their wives. And then they usually come back. What happens in contemporary times, they ask the sheikh and they ask different mashayikh or different imams and different people trying to find a way to make sure that they can keep their family together. Because maybe they've done this multiple times, sometimes more than 10, 15, 20 times because it's always a happening. So one, one of the things the, the scholars mention and this is in accordance to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, there's no divorce and no manumission of slave in cases of extreme anger. So going by this hadith, uh, this hadith, this hadith, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu uh, which is declared Hassan, who is narrated in uh, Abu Dawood, uh, Ahmed, Al-Hakim, Ibn Majah, and Al-Bayhaqi, that operating by this hadith, we see that is if the person has reached a certain level of anger, you know, and some of the scholars, they explain that that level of anger is when the intellect is not present, meaning they, they're not aware of what they're doing. They're so angry. Some people become so angry and they don't have any idea what they're saying. They are unable to contain themselves and control themselves. This is kind of beyond their capacity. So in this situation, the divorce doesn't happen. But if it's less than that, uh, and, and even if it's, uh, it's anger, but it's not to the 
to the level of which their intellect, they're, they're, they're not aware of what they're saying, and they're exactly aware of what they're saying, then this uh, divorce takes place. So it lets us know the seriousness of talaq. And this is why we're studying those these ahadith to get, uh, to reinforce the importance of that and to learn some of the rulings and the ahkam pertinent to it. Uh, another important point regarding talaq is also that when the, the scholars, the fuqaha, they mention that the pronouncement of divorce made uh, jokingly is considered to have taken place. So it shows us that this is one of the most serious, uh, uh, you know, regarding divorce and marriage and these matters, that these are some of the most serious affairs to not joke with. That a person should be very serious and careful. It shows us caution with regards to our tongue when it comes to the marital bond, uh, you know, because, you know, families are broken, feelings are hurt, and so on and so forth. And this can sometimes be done just by jokingly. So, uh, and, and this comes from the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there are three things which, whether undertaken seriously or in jest, are treated as serious. Marriage, divorce, and taking back a wife after divorce was not final, meaning during her idda. Uh, and this hadith is, ha is, is Hassan, is graded Hassan. And this hadith is narrated by Abu Dawood, a Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, and Al-Hakam. And, uh, and, Al uh, and so this lets us know that this is one of those very serious matters though, pertaining to marriage and divorce. That there's something not to joke about. It's something not to take lightly uh, when joking with one's spouse about a divorce and so forth. Another important point of uh, divorce that we want to mention, uh, and we'll get into this more, especially in the second hadith, is that it's permissible to divorce a woman who is in a state of purification in which she has not been touched, meaning uh, they have not had sexual relationship. This is very, very important, and we're going to drill this, uh, we're going to drill this uh, this ruling into our heads and reiterate it when we get to the uh, second hadith which which deals directly with that so it lets us know that when a man uh, divorces his wife according to the Sharia according to Islam according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that the woman should should not be on her menses she should be uh, he, uh, she should be free from her menses and he should not have had sexual relations with her. So that shows us that it restricts the divorce. That if you want to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this unfortunate incident, which can be unfortunate and sometimes maybe it's fortunate, sometimes it's better for people to separate and we're going to talk about that, that you want to be in accordance with the Sharia, in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that by divorcing uh, a woman during her, uh, when she is, uh, during her menses, her, her menstrual cycle, or during her, uh, after the menstruation, maybe she became pure, and then you had sexual relationships, then, then you wanted to divorce her, that this divorce is called a talaq a bid'i, that this is called the innovated uh, divorce. This is not according to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and the scholars differ over this. There are two basic uh, opinions about this. Some say that the talaq, they all say that this is bid'ah, but some say that talaq al bid'i, this innovated talaq, that it happens, that it is the person, they have a, he, he has a sin for doing this, and it is considered one of the divorces. The other groups say no, and we're going to talk about this more in depth, that no, the divorce does not happen because it is a bid'ah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu 
that whoever innovates in this affair of ours will have it rejected. So therefore that this act is rejected, meaning that the luck doesn't take place. This is what the, the argument of the other group of scholars. So there are two views about this and we will talk about this view uh, more in depth. Getting on to the hadith itself, Imam uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, he mentioned in the 915th hadith according to our, uh, our copy, narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the lawful thing which Allah hates most is divorce. Uh, reported by Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah, Al-Hakam graded it as authentic, while Abu Hatim held that the stronger view is that it is morsel, missing link, uh, missing a link after the tabi. So if it is morsel, then it is considered a weak hadith. Uh, this hadith has many benefits, however, that we will talk about, uh, and which are applicable, of course, if this is an authentic hadith. Uh, and so it's very important for us to discuss this as Ibn Hajar felt it was uh, necessary to put in his book, Bulu Amaram, for that reason. And some of the points that we want to mention with regards to this hadith is it shows that not all things which are permissible are loved by Allah. Okay, if this is an authentic hadith, this hadith illustrates that. It points to that, that point that although talaq is a lawful thing, and we know from the meaning of the hadith that, uh, of course, talaq is permissible. It's a part of Islam. It's, a, you know, sometimes people cannot maintain the marital bond, and sometimes it's better for them to separate. And so, with that being the case, uh, this is something which is permissible, but having the repercussions of talaq, which are often can be very devastating, especially if children are involved, is not something that's pleased to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not something, uh, yeah, it's not something that is pleased to Allah azza wa jal. Uh, moving on to the important benefits of this hadith, some of the fawa'id of this hadith, if it is a sound, if it, uh, we consider it a sound narration, one of the points is that we learn that the asl of talaq is karaha. So that the origin of the talaq is that it is something which is disliked. And with that being said, uh, and that's what this hadith shows. This hadith shows us, if it is a sound hadith, but this is what we deduce from the meaning according to the ulama, is that the asl is that it is disliked because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes it in accordance with this hadith. And... Likewise, as we mentioned when we began this chapter of the Kitab al-Nikah, that we mentioned that Nikah falls on the five ahkam al-taklif, the five uh, rulings, uh, Sharia rulings. Likewise, uh, this hadith illustrates that likewise divorce as well, that sometimes divorce can be wajib, sometimes it can be muharram, tahrim, Sometimes it can have karaha, meaning that it's disliked, and sometimes it can be uh, mustahab or recommended, whereas other times it's just mubaha, that it is uh, permissible. Some of the case scenarios that we could look at, uh, when it, sometimes it may be an obligation for, for divorce to happen, and one of those cases might be a situation where you have a man and he says, he swears by Allah, or he, he uh, is firm that he says, I am not going to have relations with my wife. He is firm, he's firmly resolved about this. And that is a part of her right, you know, that the, the, the both the men and the women, as we talked about in, at the beginning of our study of Nikah, that uh, the right of sexual intercourse and in sexual relations is a part of uh, the marital bond. And it's a right that the woman and the man both uh, possess. They both have this right. And with that being the case, if a man is determined, he says, you know, he swears or he de is determined not to have relations with her, then under this situation, 
uh, especially if she is not pleased with this ruling. If she says, okay, I have no problem, I stay, I'll stay with you, you're impotent. Or, uh, you know, so maybe he's unable to, even. Uh, and she wants that to the extent that she wants to be separated. In this situation, uh, it will become an obligation to separate them, for him to divorce her, because he is unable to give her her haq, if she desires that haq. If she says, I can pass on that, I can be patient, or whatever the case may be, then this is different. Likewise, if he is determined not to do that, give her her right, then also, likewise, the judge, if it's brought to uh, a hakim, then he should he will be made to divorce her. It will be an obligation to divorce her. That's one of the cases. Another case where it might be... Uh, Um, where it becomes muharram to have to 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 divorce. This is the case scenario where it becomes uh, muharram. In this situation, for example, would be if a man divorces his wife during uh, her menses, why she is uh, she is having her her period. So during this time, that this would be muharram because this is a bid'ah. And as we and kulu bid'atin dalala wa kulu dalalatin fin nar. As the Prophet ﷺ said, every bid'ah, every innovation uh, leads, leads astray and every leading astray uh, leads to the hellfire. Uh, every misguidance, you know, every act of misguidance leads to the fire. And so with that being the case, then the talaq takes that hukum that it is muharram. It is muharram a talaq bid'i. And the ulama, they have consensus on this. The, another scenario... So it would be during the menses, and as we already mentioned prior to this, likewise, if she has been purified after her menses, she's taken a shower, she's finished her, her, her menses, and then he has sexual relations with her, then he wants to divorce her, you know, any time after that. That is also talaq bid'i. So, and then the mes'ala comes up, as we mentioned, the scholars have two statements. Hal waqa'u lam yaqa'u. Does the does the divorce uh, is the divorce uh, considered a divorce, or is it not considered a divorce because it's a bid'ah? Is it a rejected divorce and it's not counted as one of the divorces? So the scholars differ over that view, and I hold the view as Ben uh holds and explains that it does not uh, happen, meaning that the the this talaq bid'i does not happen, so it is not considered one of the divorces. Uh, the next hadith will get much more in depth uh, with regards to that. So this is the case when the talaq uh, is muharram in, under this situation. To, to divorce a woman during her menses or divorce a woman when she, uh, after having had sexual intercourse with her. Uh, another one of the ahkam uh, that we learn is sometimes it can be uh, recommended to divorce if, for example, uh, there is harm for the woman to remain with her husband, then depending on the circumstances, this can actually be uh, recommended that uh, he divorce her and not be an obligation, but it can actually be recommended that if she stays with him, she will uh, be harmed or it will be... Uh, yeah, there, that there will be some harm and that there's some maslaha, a, a great, a, you know, a greater benefit for the woman to be out of that marriage than to remain in that marriage. Another situation would be, uh, and, uh, you know, one of the other ahkam is when it becomes mubaha. Uh, and in this situation, meaning that if there is some haja or necessary, some societal reason or something related to their living status or something like this then uh, and, and this is a difficult one to to so order or to imagine but there could be certain situations where then it, it becomes permissible perhaps in a situation we can maybe think of a case and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but maybe uh, in a, a war zone for example in Syria or what have you some other country uh, where there's chaos and war and the man is, is going to fight or what have you 
and he knows there's a very small chance he's going to be back, and there is, um, you know, it's it's just not, you know, beneficial uh, for the woman, and he sees that he believes it's going to be harmful for her. So perhaps in this situation, this may be uh, mubah, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. And then likewise, the other ahkam regarding it being disliked, and we mentioned that that is the asl, as Sheikh bin Uthaymeen, he mentions, Rahimullah, Rahmatullah, Alay Rahmatin, Wasiya. Uh, those are some of the important aspects pertinent uh, to this hadith, is that it illustrates for us those uh, ahkam, a khamsa, a taklifiyah, and that uh, those are important if this, especially if this hadith is uh, sound, if it is a sound hadith, however, uh, those are ulama that hold that it is a weak narration, but however, the general meaning, uh, we find immense benefits from it that are relevant for and supported by other evidences in the Sharia. In the next hadith, the 916th hadith, narrated Ibn Umar, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. In the time of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he divorced his wife while she was menstruating. So Umar, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, asked Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about that, and he replied, Command him to take her back and keep her till she is purified from menses, meaning has another period and is then purified. If he then wishes, he may keep her, and if he wishes, he may divorce her before having intercourse with her. That is the idda, the waiting period, which Allah commanded for the divorce of women, mutafakun alayhi, this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Another narration by Muslim has, command him to take her back, then divorce her when she is pure from the menstrual discharge or pregnant. Another narration by Bukhari has it was regarding regarded as one divorce. Uh, a narration of Muslim has Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala said if you had only made one or two pronouncements of divorce uh, it would have been better. Indeed Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam commanded me to take her back then keep her till she has another period, then give her a reprieve till she is purified, then divorce her before having intercourse with her. As for you, you have divorced her with three pronouncements at once and have therefore disobeyed your Lord, uh, the Creator, concerning what He commanded you regarding the divorce of your wife. Another narration of Muslim has Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, so he returned her to me and did not re, uh, and did not regard it as anything and said, when she is purified, either divorce her or keep her. This, uh, these narrations have immense uh, fawa, immense uh, immense benefits for us to draw and, and and to understand the ahkam of the talaq, the ahkam of divorce, and. Looking at these group of ahadith and these various narrations, some of the things that we learn is, uh, for one, that it's prohibited to divorce during the menstruation period. Uh, and uh, another point that some of the scholars mention is that without the consent of a woman, man can withdraw his decision. Because as we mentioned prior to this, that the divorce, the asl is, is that it is in the hands of the man. And even the khula, as we mentioned prior to this, that the khula is at the, uh, the request of the woman. Um, but again, it's still she is requesting the man to set her free and that she is willing to return the mahar in that, uh, in that case to dissolve the uh, marriage. And so uh, this these group of these uh, group of hadith uh, hadith they show us 
that the talaq, they illustrate that it's in the hands of the man. Likewise, uh, uh, another important aspect is this hadith also affirms the ahkam that we mentioned prior to this, that the, uh, the divorce, in order for it to be according to the sharia, according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu that it should not take place when? When there is menstruation, when the woman is menstruating, during her menses. So if she has a seven-day menses during that period, uh, a man cannot divorce his wife. Likewise, if after that menses, or basically after having had sexual intercourse, that it is also impermissible to divorce a woman. So that shows you it's a very narrow window when actually talaq takes place. Unfortunately, many societies and cultures, we are unaware of that and we just divorce anytime, any way, not even according to the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. And so those two scenarios are talaq bid'iya, and we learn that from this group of hadith. Likewise, or in addition to this, we see that the divorce itself, uh, the Sharia-based uh, talaq, is when, is after uh, a woman has had her menses and there has been no sexual relations. So for example, a woman has, has her menses in seven days, five days, whatever it is for the particular woman, and then she has made a ghusl, she's purified herself, and then uh, the husband has made maybe already made the decision or whatever the case may be for whatever the scenarios and he divorces her. This is the Sharia based divorce, meaning that they have not had sexual relations. And this is in accordance. We know this from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and from this Hadith, primary, primarily these, this group of Ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi Wasallam. Some of the many fawa'id or benefits uh, of this hadith is that one is that we learn that uh, the permissibility of someone uh, asking on behalf of someone else for a sharia ruling. So in this case it was Umar radiallahu ta'ala an uh, that he asked on behalf of Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala uh, to, to obtain this hukum shari about you know him him having divorced his wife while she uh, was uh, on her period while she was in her menses and another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the tahrim or the impermissibility of divorcing during menstruation. So this, these group of ahadith illustrate for us uh, that it is impermissible to do that. And we know this because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ordered uh, Omar to relay this to uh, Ibn Omar for him to take her back, to take her back. And the fact that the, the statement, take her back, murhu uh, that this was in the command imperative form, the imperative form, that he said, and command him to take her back. So this is where you have the, the, uh, the difference of opinion uh, the, both arguments are framed around this left, around this uh, this statement of taking her back. Some say that there is no taking her back unless she, of course, is divorced. That this is the case when you take someone back. And so this is a part of their argument for saying that the divorce happened even though it's a bid'ah and it was sinful. The other group of scholars say, no, the divorce uh, didn't take place and that this statement 
is still ambiguous, even though it's an, in the imperative form, but that it's Im ambiguous in that it has it can have more than one meaning. It does not necessitate that it means that uh, that this taking back is after divorce, uh, and that you know, and that instead this is a taking her back in, in a linguistic way of saying you know basically know that in meaning know that divorce didn't take place. Take her back, you know, because you pronounce this. So basically, you know, get get back together. Uh, so this is where you see uh, the difference in understanding and the difference different views. We just wanted to introduce these two views with regarding this left because you'll find that both views are supported by the same hadith. So if you go to a sheikh and he says yes. Uh, the divorce actually happened even though it was a bid'ah. And maybe you go to another sheikh, he says, no, the divorce didn't happen because it is a bid'ah. Okay? Then you at least have some understanding of this argument. Uh, so, uh, what we also learn from this hadith, which is pertinent to that, to what we just discussed, is that something that is considered muharram, uh, is not necessarily applicable in the shara. So in this case, meaning, in this case, the divorce, which is, uh, the scholars agree is muharram, that this divorce, the, the divorce when you divorce her on her menses, and in this case, this was the case of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, that he divorced her on her menses, that this is muharram. This is not permissible in Islam. And... Ben Uthaymeen mentions, so those scholars that hold this view, that it didn't take place, he says, أَنَّ muharram لَا يَمْفُضْ شَرْعٍ That the, that which is impermissible uh, is not applicable in the shar, Meaning that that divorce, uh, that that pronouncement of divorce is, is, in, is inadmissible. That it is not applicable because... So, it, meaning it didn't actually happen, even though, and the reason being is because it was done in a haram way. It was, uh, it was muharram. So, that's one of the, the benefits that we derive from this hadith as well. Another uh, point of this hadith is that also that it is impermissible to divorce a woman uh, when she even if she's been purified, but then you had relations with her. So we learn both that during her menses, it's impermissible to divorce her. And likewise, after her menses, and then you had sexual relations with her, it's impermissible to divorce her at that time. Another benefit uh, of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates that the sunnah yufasar al-Qur'an or to Fasr al-Qur'an, that the Sunnah explains the Qur'an because we know and understand those ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions about the idda and the quru and, and so forth, and, and, and these ahkam per pertinent to uh, divorce and nikah, we know their application from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know, we understand them in light of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And this is why we say that's a talaq bid'iyah, because in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hukum he gave uh, Ibn Umar, we understand that that's an explanation of uh, the Qur'anic verses. And one of the, uh, the hadith that, uh, you know, that illustrate that within uh, those ahadith that we mentioned, is a statement uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, فَتِلْكَ عِدَّةُ وَالَّتِي أَمَرَ اللَّهُ أَنْ تُطَلَّقَ لَهَا النِّسَى That verily this is the, that is the idda, that is the, the waiting period which Allah has commanded that you divorce the women during it, you know, this is this is the period. So this is the explanation. We know what it means. We know the the meaning of idda. We know the the meaning of, of those ayat that refer to uh, 
the uh, talaq and the inda, you know, the waiting period and so forth, we know that from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu So, the sunnah explains the Qur'an. That's a, that's a benefit we derive from this hadith. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows that it is permissible for a man, of course, to divorce his wife uh, uh, that's pregnant. So, it is permissible for a man to divorce his pregnant wife, and even if he had relations with her, okay, meaning she was pregnant, and then and they had relations, he can uh, and and in that situation, the uh, the idda, the waiting period is until she is. Uh, uh, until until she has the the ba the baby that this is her her uh, her waiting period. Uh, another benefit of this hadith or these this group of a hadith is uh, that is derived from this group of hadith is that if a man divorces a woman that doesn't have height that doesn't have a mensa. So this is an important mas'ala that we need to look at, and you'll look at this more in your fiqh lessons. But that, that if a man divorces a woman who does not have her menstruation, either due to the fact that she's very young in age, pre uh, you know, before uh, the age of menses, uh, or that she is uh, a woman who has... Uh, who is beyond the, the time of menses. She no longer has her menses. And in this situation, then their idda is counted by, uh, by the, uh, because she has no, it's, it's, it's counted by time, by ushur, by, by, by months. It's a month, you know, a monthly cycle. Her idda, it's counted by the monthly cycle. So, uh, for example, a woman in this situation uh, who is who can no longer have periods or has not had her period, and then they divorced, then her idda would be counted uh, as you know from three months, not three menstrual cycles, because she no longer has her her menses. Those are just some of the benefits of this hadith and there are so many